Deputy Superintendent for the Division of Educator, Student, and School Supports at the Michigan Department of Education. I have the honor today of introducing our State Superintendent of Public Instruction for this great state of Michigan, Dr. Michael Rice, who will share our focus for today and its intentionality to offer Michigan educators the opportunity to expand their historical knowledge relative to Asian Americans and the United States. It is through his vision that we provide an assurance of Michigan students having opportunities to learn history from a comprehensive stance. As such, Dr. Rice is committed to the teaching of history through diverse viewpoints while highlighting historical movements and moments that have shaped our nation. His vision will aid in the rise of student engagement and excitement around historical content on civic involvement. And now we will hear from him, Dr. Rice. Thank you, Dr. Chapman. Welcome everyone to the Michigan Department of Education's Comprehensive History Instruction Webinar Series. Today, we are fortunate to have two outstanding presenters to discuss Asian Americans in the United States, immigration and citizenship. This session offers educators greater depth of knowledge of the rich history and contributions of Asian Americans and their efforts for inclusion both nationally and in Michigan. This is the third broad topic in a series that the department will offer associated with a comprehensive teaching of US and world history. As educators, we have the responsibility to teach the full breadth of history, including about difficult and challenging subjects such as race, racism, colonialism, sexism, and xenophobia. This broad effort will help educators learn more about historical movements events and peoples that are part of the complex, diverse history of our country and world, and by extension, to help teach and share with students that same comprehensive history. We are grateful for our presenters today, Dr. Naoko Wake and Professor of History at Michigan State University, and also the Director of the Asian Pacific American Studies Program, and Dr. Andrea Louie, Professor of Anthropology at Michigan State University, and founding director of the Asian Pacific American Studies Program at MSU. Today's educational experts will present information related to the Asian American experience in the United States so that educators are more knowledgeable and are more capable of inspiring their students in their classrooms. I'd like to thank our presenters for sharing their expertise in assisting the growth of knowledge and empathy in our society the supporting education organizations whose partnership in an era of attempts to narrow curriculum and encourage subject and book banning is inspiring in and of itself, the Teaching Comprehensive History webinar series team for continued efforts in organizing spaces for us to meet and learn, and finally, to our attendees for joining us in this instructional journey. Thank you all for your courage and conviction. Thank you, Dr. Rice. We appreciate uh, that introduction and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Scott Koenig and I am the Social Studies Consultant for the Michigan Department of Education. We're thrilled to have all of you in attendance as we continue the Comprehensive History webinar series. Before I introduce today's presenters, I want to, sh want to share a few housekeeping announcements. Participants video, audio and chat features have been turned off. Questions for our presenters uh, may be added using the Q&A feature and questions will be addressed toward the end of this event, time permitting. If we run out of time, we'll follow up with a Q&A through an email. Also, if you would like sketches, please be sure to sign in on the sketches link that will be provided in the chat uh, several times throughout today's presentation. You can adjust your speaker's view uh, options anytime by selecting the view button at the top right of the Zoom window. And towards the end of today's presentation, a survey link will be placed in the chat. Please provide us with your feedback. Closed captioning and American Sign Language interpreter have been provided. If closed captioning isn't automatically visible, select the CC option and select Enable. Your interpreter for today is Marilyn Corlett. Thanks, Marilyn. So joining us today, Dr. Naoko Wake 
is a professor of history at Michigan State University and also the director of the Asian Pacific American Studies Program, a historian of gender, sexuality, and illness in the Pacific region. She has authored two books, Private Practices, Harry Stack Sullivan, The Science of Homosexuality, and The American Liberalism, and American Survivors, uh, Trans-Pacific Memories of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, co-authored with Shinpei Takeda. Hiroshima and Nagasaki Beyond Ocean, published in both English and Japanese, and written many articles and book chapters. As part of her research, she has created the largest oral history archive of Asian American survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings in 1945 in the world, housed in MSU's Vincent Voice Library in East Lansing, Michigan, as well as the Den Show Japanese American Legacy Project in Seattle, Washington. Her current book project is the history of mental and physical disability in Asian Pacific Islander Desi American families and communities, which explores how Asian American disability have been shaped by trans-Pacific history of war, militarism, colonialism, and diaspora. Dr. Andrea Louie is a professor of anthropology. She has conducted research exploring how ideas constructed around Chineseness as a racial and cultural identity have been reworked as transnational processes to bring Chinese from different parts of the world into contact with one another. Her book, Chineseness Across Borders, Renegotiating Chinese Identities in China and the US, won Association for Asian American Studies Social Sciences Book Award, March 2006. Her second book, How Chinese Are You? Adopted Chinese Youth and Their Families Negotiate Identity and Culture examines the cultural socialization and racialization of children adopted from China in the U.S. She is currently working on a project on Chinese international students and on a new book project focusing on multiple narratives surrounding the story of Toi Lan Gun, a Chinese immigrant who was selected as U.S. Mother of the Year in 1952. Dr. Louis teaches courses on transnational processes and identities, China and Asian Americans. She is the founding director of the Asian Pacific American Studies Program at MSU. Welcome, Dr. Louie. Welcome, Dr. Wake. Thank you. Thank you. For that great introduction. Um, so we wanted to start this presentation off with um, a broader picture of why it's important to even um, think about Asian Americans place in the United States um, and to incorporate information on Asian Americans in, into your um, curriculum. <clears throat> um, the history of Asian Americans um, informs in events that are currently very much affecting the Asian American population. Um, so this first slide that we have is anti-Asian hate past and present. Um, and it talks about an incident that happened um, a while ago, about 50 years ago, and also um, more recent events that are still ongoing. Um, the Vincent Chin murder of 1982 occurred in Highland Park. Um, we will be talking more about him in later seminars, um, but he was uh, murdered by two um, laid off auto workers um, who targeted him because he was Asian. They used actually anti Japanese slurs, and these men did not um, face any. Um, they were basically found um, to be not guilty and didn't serve jail, jail sentences. Um, but anti Asian hate um, pre predates the Vincent. Vincent Chin murder, and it also continues now. Um, we, as we can see, there have been over 11,000 hate incidents across the US um, since the pandemic started. We often talk about this as a twin pandemic of COVID-19 and anti-Asian hate. Um, so um, one of the things that we're gonna be talking about today is Asian Americans being seen as not belonging in the US. Um, we'll, we'll be talking about citizenship, but citizenship is not just legal. Um, it's also social and cultural. So uh, I'd like to give you a quick overview of what's to come during the rest of our presentation today. So uh, as Professor Louis mentioned, um, uh, 
anti-Asian or Asian American heat is, is nothing new, it has deep history. To understand that and our Asian American response to that, including social movement that uh, culminated in the late 1960s and early 1970s, which uh, is going to be one of the topics that we'll be covering later in this series, we need to understand who Asian Americans are, where they came from, and uh, some of the key concepts, uh, 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 some, something like uh, citizenship or its relationship to immigration. Uh, so uh, we will start by definitions. Uh, so who are Asian Americans and what is citizenship, uh, especially as it relates to Asian American experiences and its relation to immigration more generally. And what about birthright citizenship and naturalization? And uh, there are different kinds of uh, citizenship acquisitions. Uh, it could be G. Sanguinis or G. Soli. Or as Professor Lee mentioned uh, earlier, there are different kinds of citizenship, legal or social and cultural. And to understand all this, we'll like to uh, look at some of the specific cases. I think uh, in my teaching at least, case studies are really powerful. Students really uh, learn so much, take away so much from being able to put individual faces and experiences to the vast history that we often teach in our classes or a bit vast information about society and culture that we teach in our classroom. So we like to look at particular cases such as Ozawa and Thin cases back in the 1920s and their historical roots. And also we like to look at uh, Bagai's story and Asian Americans in Michigan. There are quite a few Asian Americans and their experiences need to be better taught, we believe, in uh, uh, across different uh, uh, places, different classrooms. So just as a resource, I like to share uh, uh, online resource that really could work as a great basis for your lesson plans. So uh, if you uh, click on this uh, link, you can see how Asian American experiences are sort of broken down into different themes and the questions. And some of the themes that we will talk about, uh, for instance, discussion questions that we just uh, looked at on page two of this website, uh, that could be really a great discussion question to open up uh, you know, students' engagement in your classroom. So we really wanted to share that with you because I think it could be really useful. Um, so this quote is taken from an edited volume, Asian Americans in Michigan, that came out in 2015. Um, and I just wanted to contextualize Asian Americans in Michigan within the broader picture of Asian American population in general. Um, I, I like this quote because it um, speaks to the depth of Asian American history in the Midwest. Um, you know, um, talking about how Asian Americans have been in the Midwest longer than many people realize. Um, and um, this includes, of course, Detroit, but also Chicago, Milwaukee, and, and many other locations um, in the Midwest. Um, this is also a great resource um, for teachers, this um, Asian Americans in Michigan volume that I think was published by, actually, I don't remember right now. So. I think it might be Wayne State Press, but I, I'm not positive. Um, next slide, please. All right, we also wanted to provide a little bit of um, an overview of the Asian American population um, nationally. So this is from the Pew Center um, Research Center report. Um, again, uh, very accessible to teachers as a resource. So th these are just a couple of screenshots showing um, the one on the left, how quickly the Asian American population is growing, having doubled um, between 2000 and 2019. And then you can see um, the projected um, growth uh, is exponential. Uh, and also to discuss the diversity of Asian Americans, there are a lot of assumptions and um, stereotypes about Asian Americans that uh, oftentimes associate Asian Americans with being only Chinese or, um, or Japanese, but actually this graphic shows that um, the population is quite diverse. And this doesn't even include 
Um, if you look at the very right, the 15% under all others, which encompasses many, many, many different groups from different parts of Asia representing different socioeconomic statuses and, and experiences, including refugee experiences. Um, next slide, please. Um, so the graphic on the left shows that Asians um, are projected to become the largest immigrant group in the US surpassing Hispanics um, by, uh, as you see over time, um, by the year um, 2065, or actually maybe it looks like earlier than that. Um, and um, if you look at the map of the US, you see that you know the population in the Midwest is not um, the majority, but we are here. Um, and oftentimes Asian Americans are um, thought to be coastal populations, especially associated with the West Coast. And of course the majority are there. Um, but there are Asian American populations in the Midwest and the South, and they have distinct experiences as well um, because of being in these locations. Um, so I think while it's important to look at the big picture of Asian Americans nationally, it's also important to think about more localized experiences um, that your students may also be, be part of. Next slide, please. Yes. Yeah, so. Um... Let's get to the definitional aspect of Asian Americans. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, there are different ways for Asian Americans to be here, um, be either excluded or included into citizenship rights. So there are two ways in which one acquires citizenship. Uh, one is birthright through birth. If you are born um, here and if you are born to US citizens, parents, then you could be uh, US citizens. That's something that probably people, majority of them uh, here do not even think about. And the second way, of course, is a naturalization through legalization. That's how many first generation immigrants who were born and maybe even raised elsewhere outside of US at one point in their lives come here and become a US citizen, a citizen uh, through uh, legalization processes. And I like to further elaborate by saying that uh, there are, in fact, two ways in which one acquires birthright citizenship. One is the right of blood, ji sanguinis, uh, which means born to parents or grandparents who are US citizens. And the second way is uh, uh, ji soli, which is right of soil, which means that if you are born in the physical territory of the state, then you acquire US citizens. Um, it actually raises interesting questions uh, to especially people who are born in US territories, uh, who has uh, many uh, interesting and oftentimes uh, complicated history of uh, being colonized by US. So uh, it's a nice uh, basic concepts that could be a really a basis of many different lesson plans in your classroom. And I'd like to quickly mention also that uh, Citizenship can be legal, as you see in those different definitions, but also it can be cultural, something that's based on my interaction with you or uh, interaction between different communities from different backgrounds. So uh, I'm hoping that uh, would be a nice segue into the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so this slide, I know it's quite text heavy, but I wanted to pull definitions of legal citizenship and cultural citizenship. This particular definition of legal citizenship emphasizes um, that race or the idea of race um, and who um, should be allowed to come into the U.S. and who should not be allowed to come into the U.S. based on this idea of race um, is an integral part of legal definitions of citizenship. Um, and this quote points specifically um, to Chinese exclusion laws of the 1880s, um, which basically affected Asian Americans until 1965, um, despite the repeal in 1943. And then the definition on the right speaks to this idea of cultural citizenship that Dr. Wake referred to earlier. Um, it's not how we often think of citizenship. We think of, oh, if you're a citizen, you know, you automatically be, become part of the U.S., automatically belong. But as you can see from this definition, cultural citizenship um, talks about the right to be different 
And this can mean in terms of race, ethnicity, native language, other aspects um, with respect to the norms of the dominant national community without compromising one right to belong. So cultural citizenship re really refers to this idea of being seen as part of the U.S. and feeling like you belong in the U.S. Um, regardless of your actual citizenship status. Next slide, please. So actually, uh, there is a term, uh, perpetual foreigner, which often refers to the lack of citizenship, especially cultural citizenship that many Asian Pacific Americans experience, despite the fact that they have legal citizenship. And I like us to quickly go over um, this rather hefty list of many immigration laws that really spoke to both uh, legal and cultural citizenship or lack thereof. Um, so I like to say, first of all, citizenship includes, but also excludes. They are powerful notion that really shape people's experiences. And uh, even though I will not spend a lot of time in going over each one of those uh, uh, seven key laws uh, or acts that um, I like to share with you. Uh, I like to say that um, if you can even include one or two acts that uh, resonate well with you in your classroom, that would really be the great basis for uh, students who may pursue education in colleges or um, later on after you uh, after they take your class because any immigration race uh, related courses will be uh, talking about all of those laws one way or another and i like to say even though i'm not sharing right now with you uh, if you follow the link that's in embedded in this uh, slide uh, this gives you a really wonderful overview of many important laws and acts related to immigration and race and citizenship. And this website, uh, which I am going to show you later uh, in our presentation today. Um, so um, this is a website created by the, uh, um, the uh, in, uh, Immigration and Ethnic History Society, which is the uh, flagship uh, scholarly association here in the United States uh, scholar among scholars who study uh, race and immigration and their histories. So this is a great resource. I like to just quickly mention that it's, it's there. So starting with 1790, uh, Nationality Act defined that uh, US citizenship is eligible, uh, I'm sorry, US citizenship is open to only free, free white persons. So no other uh, races were included in the privilege of US citizenship. And 1870 Naturalization Act expanded the privilege of US citizenship to the, uh, the persons of African descent. So that still excluded a lot of different groups of uh, people who are not either white race or African American uh, uh, race. And when I say race, however, I am really using the hist it's a historical term. Modern and contemporary understanding of race is that it's very difficult to clearly define such a concept as race, but I'm just using it because that's what people of the past thought to be possibly a concept that could be clearly and cleanly defined. So uh, moving on to the late 19th century, there is a famous or infamous to, to be more precise, uh, Chinese Exclusion Act 1882, that for the first time in US history, uh, history of immigration laws excluded certain groups of immigrants based on their race. So uh, this Chinese Exclusion Act banned uh, immigrants from China to the United States. Uh, especially with regard to laborers. There are uh, still students or diplomats or business persons who are allowed to come in even after 1882. But however, given the, the disproportion, disproportionately large um, uh, percentage of laborers uh, who were uh, from China uh, in the US, uh, it eliminated a large number of uh, prospective immigrants from China. And I also like to say, it's not just a matter of uh, either you include or exclude at a border, at the US border, when it comes to history of immigration and citizenship as they relate to Asian Americans. Uh, there are uh, domestic laws uh, that really made a huge difference uh, for Asian Americans. 
For instance, 1913 alien land laws, um, first actually initiated by the state of California, but later on until 1920s, kept on expanding across the Western states. Uh, it essentially prohibited Asians from uh, owning land, which was quite devastating to many Asian immigrants of the time who were here and uh, were already the owners of land. And interestingly, uh, they try to find a way around it. <laughs> uh, sometimes responses that immigrants can come up with quite inventive and creative. So that's part of the fun of teaching and studying Asian American history for me. But uh, many of the, uh, for instance, Japanese immigrants who were already landowner, landowners by then uh, decided that they would put their children's name on the piece of paper so that uh, their children who are again by birth US citizens, unlike the first generation immigrants themselves who are their parents who are not eligible for citizenship because of 17, 19 and 1870 laws, they were able to claim the right to the land. So people with US born US citizen children were able to get around the law, but nonetheless, it um, severely limited uh, Asian uh, immigrants' ability to belong, uh, both legally, but also culturally and economically to this nation. And uh, in some ways, restriction on Asian immigrants culminated in 1924 Johnson-Reed Act, uh, also referred to simply as 1924 Immigration Act. And that essentially uh, excluded all immigrants from Asia. And in this case, Asia was very, very broadly defined. We will show you the map of this going back to a few years before 1924 that defined the area of Asia uh, from which immigration was uh, completely banned. Uh, coming closer to our time, 1952 Macaron Water Act, it's a, essentially when immigration law started to move toward liberalization. So America started to open a little more doors to new immigrants uh, based on this uh, water, uh, Macaron Water Act. And uh, what it says essentially is that uh, we are still going to limit number of immigrants uh, coming from particular nation depending on their origins. However, for people who are already here, we are going to open the right for naturalization for immigrants who are not yet American citizens. So that essentially uh, made it uh, that possible for immigrants who are non US citizens at that point in history to be able to apply and become naturalized. So that's uh, one way, one of the two ways I mentioned earlier for a person to be US citizen. Uh, so 1952 law really uh, act really made a difference for this reason. And the 1965 Part Seller Act is essentially the basis of our immigration uh, system that we still have today, uh, which essentially eliminated national quotas that 1952 act still maintained. And by the way, uh, in, as of 1952, uh, many Asian countries were allowed to have only somewhere between 100 and 200 immigrants per year to come to the States. So even though there was a little bit of a quarter that's allowed to for your country uh, to, to meet, it was quite small. So it was a little bit of a clack of a door, but it's really narrow opening up until 1965. So 1965 law uh, act uh, eliminated that national quota and actually gave uh, preferences to families of uh, people who are already here and be a US permanent citizen or US citizens, or uh, it gave also preference to people who are skilled, uh, especially in STEM disciplines. Um, so uh, this uh, eventually became the basis of what we know as immigration regulation today. So uh, all of these legal mechanisms of inclusions and exclusions have real impact on people's lives. So uh, we like to go to the next slide to kind of get into the individual levels of how those laws actually change people's lives. So yes, the first example um, is very personal to me. Um, I'm 
working on a book on my grandmother's um, selection as U.S. Mother of the Year in 1952, um, currently, and one of the the big um, parts of her story as portrayed in the media during that time um, in the context of the Cold War was that her husband um, was a World War I veteran um, who, and then he passed away. And then my grandmother continued to run the laundry with the help of her eight children who um, went, most of went on to college or secondary education, um, you know, there by fulfilling the American dream. Um, all of this did happen, but I wanted to delve into this question of how my grandfather came into the U.S. and came to serve in World War I. Um, so based on this picture, this is him in his uniform, um, but there's a bit of a backstory. So um, my grandfather came into the United States around 1914, um, and he came in via Canada, as many Chinese immigrants did. They, um, probably landed in, in Vancouver and took the um, railroad across and then came in um, via Montreal um, or landed in Montreal and then came in um, and ended up on the East Coast. Um, this was the only way a Chinese immigrant could come in at this time if they were a laborer, right? If they were not um, the descendant of a citizen or um, a merchant or a scholar. Um, so um, he was rounded up by a Chinese inspector at his laundry. He was inter interviewed, um, determined to be um, su suspicious of, um, you know, because he was not, did not have any paperwork or any um, record of being legally in the US. Um, then he was brought before uh, a commissioner and um, this is, I know it's hard to read, but at the bottom, um, actually, this is the beginning of it, so it's not on this, um, but basically, um, the commissioner said, are you registered, and are you willing to fight for the United States, and he wisely said yes, um, and they determined him to be not guilty of being uh, in the U.S. illegally, um, so, um, you know, I, I, this illustrates, right, the, the com complex nature of citizenship. On the one hand, he was viewed as, right, this patriotic American, and um, he actually never saw combat, but he was in the U.S. Army in World War I. But um, the way he actually obtained a citizen was um, through having gone through this process that regulated many Chinese immigrants um, and, and um, affected many families. You know, our, my family always thinks about what would it have been like if the commissioner had just ruled the other way? Because my grandfather claimed he had birthright citizenship. He claimed he, his father, um, that he was born in San Francisco and then his father died and his mother took him back to China. Um, that was not true. He claimed birthright citizenship, but the commissioner um, granted him um, or basically said he was not guilty of being in the U.S. Uh, illegally. And that then set the ball rolling for him to apply for my grandmother to come and for the family to be created here as opposed to back in China. Next slide, please. Dr. Wake's story is also very fascinating. So my story is not exactly my family story, but this is something that really stood out for me when I was conducting research for my recent book about Asian American survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, A-bombing in 1945. It may be surprising to many of you uh, that there are Asian American people who were affected by the bombing uh, by the US military at that time. But if you think about how immigrants are connected through families and community, it is in fact not surprising that there are Asian Americans who, are, who happen to be in Japan uh, during the wartime. So in case of Judy Kumi Endo, one of the people I encountered during my research, uh, about Asian American survivors of the bomb. Uh, she had a fascinating story. Uh, first of all, she was living in uh, the California as a US born citizen. And of course, during the wartime, as many of you are familiar with, um, there was a Japanese American uh, incarceration. It was a mass incarceration that uh, rounded up and uh, sent uh, about 120,000 Japanese Americans and Japanese immigrants 
uh, both of them included to uh, different uh, camps that are in uh, in the in inland locations of the U.S. So uh, Mrs. Andrew uh, went to uh, camp in Arizona in uh, 1942, and there are two camps. One is here, and another is. Um, uh, Boston. Uh, so she was first went to uh, uh, Hila and then, then to Boston. And then, then she was sent to Hiroshima in 1942 following her husband. And interesting thing about this is that uh, many Japanese Americans decided to uh, expatriate to Japan because they were afraid of being forced to stay here while they are incarcerated and be uh, indu inducted into the US Army and having to fight their own families if they were sent to the East Asian front of the war that was ongoing at that time. So to avoid such a confrontation, uh, her husband decided to uh, go to Japan. And as, as his um, wife, um, Judy Kumi Endo, didn't have any choice but to follow him. And as it happened, however, she was younger than 21 years at that point in, in her life. So she didn't have to actually choose between US and Japanese citizenship. So she maintained dual citizenship and went to uh, Hiroshima in, with that status. But there are two things that really changed it. First of all, during the wartime Japan, there was a severe food shortage. So food was given in uh, rations. To be able to have an access to the food ration, uh, one had to have the status, meaning Japanese citizenship. So she had to acquire Japanese citizenship or more, rather she had to report it to the Japanese government. Second, she's a bomb survivor, right? So all of her belongings were burned, meaning that her documentation, either Japanese citizenship or American citizenship was lost to the bomb. So that meant that after the war, she had a very challenging situation when she was trying to prove her American citizenship so that she could come back to the US. She said that post 1945, I just couldn't prove it. Very strikingly, as part of the occupation force, uh, US occupation force that were in Japan at the time after the war, she would see her friend from Fresno, California. And then they would say to her, Judy, what are you doing here? And she was going, I, I don't know, I just can't prove it. And so it took her until 1947 for her to come back to the US as a matter of fact and be reunited with her uh, biological families. So it just kind of goes to show you how, um, especially before 1952 and 1965 immigration law uh, changes overhaul that I mentioned earlier, there are many, many, many ways in which immigrants life and rights can be compromised. And I think it's very important for us to know that there are many individual and family community stories like this when you look at Asian American history. So um, with that said, I will move to the next slide, please. So going back to the legal discussion of the issue, I like to uh, emphasize how birthright citizenship may seem natural, but it is also legal. Just to give you a snapshot of how it is not natural, it is actually arbitrarily legal, I would say. You could look at those two um, examples from history. So Elk and Wilkins uh, 1884 case uh, held that Native Americans were not citizens because they were subject to the jurisdiction of the tribe to which they belonged. So in, in this scenario, uh, citizenship is in conflict with, somehow in conflict with the tribe belonging, which is very interesting. And moving forward in 1898, uh, in US versus Wong Kim Ark uh, case, this case awarded actually birthright citizenship, which is uh, solely, as I mentioned earlier, to people of Chinese descent born in the United States. And this privilege or right was uh, extended to all Asians. So it could be legal arbitrarily, it could be inclusive, and it could be exclusive. I think those two cases are really great example of showing how um, 
you know, things can be uh, really dependent on how the law is or acts are uh, interpreted by particular court or particular cases. Next slide, please. So moving toward the individual cases I mentioned in my outline at the start of our presentation, uh, I'd like to give you a little bit further context, historical context of Ozawa and the Thin uh, decisions. So in 1878, in Ria Yup case, uh, essentially it kind of makes the in, uh, arbitrariness of the definition. And it's not just a matter of different kinds of court cases that illuminate that point, but also the definition or contradictory definition of race that uh, you can see individual cases like this. So, you know, they were trying to uh, define who white persons are. As you know from my earlier uh, comment, those are very important definitions, right? Because if you are white persons, free white person, then you are eligible for US citizenship. But who are you when you say white persons? It's very interesting. This text said that it's a there are indefinite description of those people uh, that come in every shade from the lightest brown to the most um, swarthy uh, brunette. But ordinarily speaking, it is essentially something that everybody should be able to understand when it comes to white persons. So in some ways, this is internally contradictory document in that it's acknowledging the difficulty and the variety of uh, people uh, in the skin colors, especially, or hair colors that may exist among the so-called white people as it's legally defined, right? But also they are all saying that, well, at the same time, you should know what you mean because it's a culturally common sense uh, when it comes to what you mean by saying white persons. So um, if you can move over to the next slide, uh, I can further elaborate uh, along the same lines. So further uh, elaboration of the historical context of those cases is that essentially um, uh, race is very complex notion. So it, race, if you're looking at the latter half of this, bottom half of this text, uh, race primarily means an ethnic ethnical stock, a great division of mankind having in common certain distinguishing physical peculiarities and thus constituting a comprehensive class appearing to be deprived from a distinct, uh, derived from a distinct primitive source. So I almost like to underline the word appearing, right? Because it again, depending on the cultural definition rather than scientific or medical, uh, uh, something that could be more objective kind of definition, rather it's very much cultural and even subjective definitions when it comes to race. And I like to also note that uh, Hindu is misspelled here. And I put in the Sikh, it's not in the original document obviously, but Sikh to emphasize how um, this kind of misspelling is so prevalent in Asian American history, looking at legal documents or otherwise, you see misspelled names everywhere. And I have seen, I have talked to people that I study as a historian whose names are misspelled, just like Hindus that you see on the screen here. And that really complicated their situations because they could not prove that you are the person who is actually registered in the document on which your name is misspelled, right? So small things like that can really trigger a chain of painful struggles for uh, immigrants who may be excluded rather easily by the rights of US citizenship. So uh, please move to the next slide. Um, so this is a map of, as you can see, the Asiatic Bard Zone or Asiatic Zone of Bard Citizenship um, that was um, defined in the Immigration Act of 1917. Um, one thing you may notice is that it is, covers a very, very large area, um, pretty much all of what we understand um, to be Asia. Um, it, it, it does not include um, East Asia because that was already, um, that population was already excluded. Um, so um, one of the interesting things about the creation of this barred zone is um, 
how the division, the dividing line was determined between Asian and non-Asian. And again, this follows up on what Dr. Wake was saying about the constructed nature of the category of whiteness and then also um, the corresponding category of, of Asian-ness in this case. Um, and the next slide talks a little bit more about the um, construction of the idea of whiteness. This is, as an anthropologist, I can confidently say this is not something that anthropologists um, believe exists, like that, that there are no um, defined racial, racial differences um, between what we see as ra races today, social races. Um, but um, a lot of effort was put into defining this category of Asian as opposed to white and it resulted in um, this region of the world that was then now um, legally excluded from naturalization rights to naturalization in the US. Uh, and on the right, there are some additional resources I think will be shared in um, the chat at some point. Um, there are many, many um, valuable resources out there that teachers can draw upon to talk about this. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so um, this is taken from a timeline of uh, from a book on race um, and the chapter called Inventing Whiteness. Um, so we don't think of whiteness as being invented, right? We think of it being as being natural um, to some extent, even though as Dr. Wake pointed out, there's great variation um, within the population that we think of as white, um, but essentially, um, the idea of white was um, created in order to break up working class solidarity um, and actually rebellion that was occurring among indentured servants and, and other workers um, early in the history of the United States. Um, it was designed as a way to, um, to have what these white laborers disassociate themselves from these other workers. Um, and um, then it became codified into law. So you see in 19, six, uh, 1691, the first legal term um, was used to prohibit marriage between whites and blacks. Um, and then 1790, the Naturalization Act that Dr. Wake already mentioned only allowed free white persons to become US citizens um, and um, actively um, excluded uh, African or African descendants um, from this. Um, and I think one reason that we think of race as being scientifically um, backed is um, because of this long history of scientists trying to create these racial categories. So one of the most famous was German scientist um, Blumenbach, who believed that there were three main races. And um, just to illustrate how arbitrary this was, um, he chose a, a skull from uh, a woman who lived in the Caucasus Mountains as um, a, a skull that could exemplify the white race. And this was just purely his choice. But based on that, we now have the term Caucasian to describe white people. Um, and um, also the, the creation of um, the Asi Asiatic Bard Zone was also based on using the Caucasus Mountains as a dividing line, right, between um, whites and Asians. Um, so, um, you know, science now shows that, you know, you, there's actually more genetic variation between, um, sorry, within so-called races than between so-called races. That's for another lecture. It's, this is all in this book that I mentioned. Um, but we wanted to emphasize that these laws that are being created to exclude specific races are based on construction. These races are constructed categories. Uh, so next slide. So I'd like to quickly mention some of the slides that we shared with you uh, last three or four slides. They include documents as well as visual uh, resources. And I think uh, those, are, those could be really great uh, lesson, part of lesson plans in your classroom. Um, so you can kind of pick and choose uh, that works for your particular needs, uh, but uh, sometimes the, the Asiatic bar zone map can be really striking for students because it's, it's very much there. You kind of see how vast of the coverage it was when it comes to the power of exclusion. 
And some texts are really striking as well. Um, so uh, I love to use text analysis as much as my students can stand it. Uh, so uh, that's another way to think about how to take things away from what we are sharing with you today. So uh, I like to finally uh, talk about Ozawa and uh, Thind case in 1922 and 1923. And uh, the, the bar zone map that Professor Louis uh, just showed us, it was in 1917. And we know from the earlier slide that uh, the height of the immigration restrict restriction came in 1924 in the form of Johnson Reed Act, right? So that means that those cases are really important in terms of when they happened. And to just put it simply, uh, Takeo Ozawa case was found not to be able to be naturalized because he's not racially white, according to the 1719 Nationality Act. Whereas Bagai Sin Thind, who is of South Asian origin, also was denied a right for natural naturalization uh, and become US citizens, despite the fact, although he is racially white, according to the 1790 Nationality Act. So it goes to show you how contradictory the interpretation of legal rights can be. Uh, so uh, in case of Bagai Tend, it was found that uh, he served in the US Army during World War II. And also he uh, claimed his US citizenship based on the fact that earlier case I just mentioned a few slides ago defined Hindu race, right? As uh, definitely part of white race. And so there was a, a potential for South Asians who uh, claimed that they are part of Aryan race, Aryan race to claim that they are white. And some parts of legal history indicated that US uh, legal system supported the argument, but it was denied. Um, so Thind and other uh, um, South Asian Americans were deprived, taken away their citizenship that they already had at that point. Uh, so if you sort of think about Ozawa case and the uh, Thind case, it's it's just is um, it's quite fascinating. It is contradictory, but opens up uh, the power of interpretation when it comes to who exclude who gets excluded and who gets to be included. So uh, if we can share the resource by clicking on this uh, link that's embedded in this slide. This actually goes back to what I mentioned really earlier, which is the immigration history uh, timeline. And this is actually the a part of the timeline that gives you an expanded definition of Ozawa case. And you could do the same for thin case, but if you, uh, Scott, can go to timeline, this is what I was talking about earlier. This is really a great resource. Um, you can see from Nationality Act of 1790, onward, very close to a present time. And this is really, I mean, it's really up to you which one to highlight in your lesson plans, but it's really a, a nice way to have all the important laws uh, in a single place and get the good sense of the context in which they occurred. So going back to the slide, I like to move on to the next. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, right, this is the next slide, thank you. Uh, I like to mention that the Bagai suicide note is something that is uh, that should be uh, maybe given to your students with a trigger warning. But this is a powerful resource. I, I like to say that uh, he was also from uh, the, the South Asian background, but he came to the United States because he wanted the freedom from the UK colonial power that was dominant in his home country of India at the time. He came to San Francisco only to see that his US citizenship being deprived because of the laws that we talked about, because of the acts that we talked about. Um, if you go to the immigrant voices, you can definitely see his images and as well as the stories that led to his suicide. I am not reading the quote because of the time limitation, but uh, it's very important that you know you kind of connect those voices with visual images. I'm not sure if we can go to the site, Immigrant Voices, but if you go there, um, you see that this is a very relatable person. If you scroll down, Baishino Das uh, Bagai, um, you can see, yes, that's, if you go a little further, yes, he can see that this is a uh, um, Bagai, Mr. Bagai, uh, in his own general store that he was the owner of. 
And as I was telling you earlier, when I was talking about alien landlords, um, he was deprived of citizenship, meaning that he was ineligible to be the, uh, the property owner. So that means that uh, he had to, uh, he was forced to liquidate his property and he was threatened to be deported to UK, the country whose citizenship he uh, renounced, right? Because of his passion for freedom. So it was such a historical irony that he was deprived of his, his citizenship twice, not to mention his right to property. Uh, so those are very powerful resources that you can, uh, you can, uh, share with your student. So, yeah, we had a few more slides, but I think um, in the interest of time, um, I'm not sure if we need to move on. Um, yes, absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Louis. Thank you, Dr. Wake. Thanks for your patience on my response there. <laughs> uh, just setting up the background for myself. Uh, so yes, I think with time, we will need to be considerate here, but your expertise, the knowledge base, what you've shared with us is so important and fascinating. Um, we cannot thank you enough for, um, for your um, for your efforts, your, your support for this initiative and uh, sharing uh, your information with us. So thank you many times over. Um, so to let our team uh, and group know, our attendees, uh, we thank you uh, for attending. Um, the information presented is super helpful. Uh, I do appreciate your patience with the sketches and links. I'm gonna put those in right now, or at least in a quick moment. So be patient, don't leave without getting that link. It will be in the chat for you here momentarily. Um, so stay tuned for your sketches link as well as the feedback form. Our next session in the Teaching Comprehensive History series will continue on September 21st, so next Wednesday uh, at four to 5 p.m. We invite you to register for the event if you haven't already, but majority of you uh, probably have. So we thank you for that. Um, so I'll put those registration links in the chat as well to share with your friends and, and uh, other educators, fellow educators and other professionals who'd like to join us or individuals who just want to know more about this amazing history. Um, so once again, thank you all. Uh, if you're looking for sketches, uh, I'll have that in the, the chat momentarily. Dr. Wake, Dr. Louis, uh, thank you uh, for your efforts. And we look forward to next week's presentation uh, in this historical context.